namo bhagavate vasudevaya Dubio namo yuvabio nama avadupia. Ye brahmana kam avaduta lingas. Charanti tebia shiva masturagyam. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the great personalities whether they walk on the earth's surface as children, young boys, avadhutas, or great brahmins, even if they are hidden under the different guises, I offer my respects to all of them. By their mercy, may there be good fortune in the royal dynasties that are always offending them. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. King Rahugana was very repentant because he had forced Jadbhara to carry his palaquin and therefore began offering prayers to all kinds of Brahmins and self-realized persons, even though they might be playing like children or hiding in some guises. The four Kumaras walked everywhere in the guise of five-year-old boys. And similarly, there are many Brahmins, knowers of Brahman, who traverse the globe, either as young men, children, or avadhutas. Being puffed up due to their position, the royal dynasties generally offend such great personalities. Therefore, King Rahugana began to offer his respectful obeisances unto them so that the offensive royal dynasties might not glide down into a hellish condition. If one offends a great personality, the Supreme Personality of Godhead does not excuse one. Although the great personalities themselves might not take offense, Maharaj Ambarish was offended by Durvasa, who even approached Lord Vishnu for pardon. Lord Vishnu would not grant him pardon. Therefore, he had to fall down at the lotus feet of Maharaj Ambarish. Even though Maharaj Ambarish was a Kshatriya Grihasta, one should be very careful not to offend the lotus feet of Vaishnavas and Brahmins. Hare Krishna. In today's purport, our beloved Guru Dev, Srila Prabhupada, warns us to be very careful not to offend Brahmins and Vaishnavas. It is said in this regard that the dust on the feet of a devotee is very powerful. 
It has the power to liberate us from all suffering, to open the doors to the spiritual world. It also has the power to destroy our spiritual lives and inflict us in a situation of unbearable pain. When we serve the dust of the feet of a devotee, Krishna personally is so pleased that from within and without he gives us all facilities for spiritual advancement. It is said in Bhagavatam that Krishna took the form of a little baby, Gopal. He was floating in the ocean on top of a leaf of a banyan tree. And in that form he was sucking on his toe. Why? Because his devotees, they endure great sacrifices. Sometimes they're being, they're willing to be persecuted, tortured, and killed. They're willing to give up those things that are so dear to everyone within the material creation. <laughs> Even what the demigods are longing for and fighting for, devotees give it up. Why? Just to, just to taste a speck of dust from the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. So Krishna wanted to see what that dust tasted like. As a baby, babies naturally suck their toes. At least, that's what I have been told. To see what is the nectar that the devotees are so anxious for. But one who conquers the Lord heart in this way, the dust of their lotus feet is even more sacred to the Lord than the dust of his own lotus feet. <clears throat> because a devotee has given his life or her life to Krishna, Krishna gives his life to them. As it was spoken yesterday by Madhava Maharaj, Taking the dust of the lotus feet of a Vaishnav is not just the physical, mechanical act of touching their feet. It is the consciousness and the spirit of the willingness to humble ourselves, submit ourselves, and serve that person. <clears throat> the dust is at the lowest part of that person's body. Our consciousness is feeling ourselves beneath them. It's, a, it's actually the humblest position. Taking the dust at the lotus feet of a devotee is means to take the humblest position of being a very insignificant menial servant of that person. And the Lord in a very favorable, unenvious way. And one who approaches a devotee like that, Krishna promises that he will deliver that person. He will take it upon himself. But if one offends a devotee, a sincere, dedicated devotee, as we read here, even if that devotee doesn't take offense, Krishna takes offense. He will not tolerate it. 
Krishna was so angry at Durvasa Muni for his offense, even though Ambarish Maharaj was praying for Durvasa Muni's welfare, Vishnu had his chakra chasing to destroy him. <clears throat> Neither Brahma or Shiva or Indra or all Durvas Muni's eight perfected mystic cities could protect him from the reaction of offending a devotee. Vishnu himself said, I cannot protect you. Krishna is the supreme shelter of all living beings. If Krishna can't protect us, then what hope do we have? Krishna's told, I have no power to protect you. Because I am so angry that you offended my devotee. Only if that devotee forgives you, do I have the power to protect you. That is the degree that Krishna is bound by the love of his devotee. <clears throat> These words are spoken by Maharaj Rahugana. We will continue where we left off yesterday before we were blessed by His Holiness Jai Patak Maharaj. <clears throat> we left off where Bharat Maharaj, after leaving a most beautiful, chaste, faithful, devoted queen, Obedient, educated, absolutely well-behaved children, the most magnificent palace and wealth in the entire earth, finest foods, best clothing. He left it all. He wasn't even very old by standards of that age. <clears throat> and went to the forest where he did his sadhana so well he was preparing all his life by performing his sadhana and this was the culmination where there was nothing else for him to do but then he was distracted by this little helpless deer He became so much overwhelmed with affection for this deer. Literally, day and night, he could think of nothing else. He was bound. And in doing so, all of his devotion to Krishna was forgotten. He had no proper association he was alone and somehow or other he gave up his spiritual practices his sadhana therefore he fell deeply into illusion and in that state he was dying the end of his life was near and the little deer was sitting next to him as he was dying. The deer was terribly aggrieved. Bharat was her shelter, her guardian, very life and soul, everything. Shukadeva Goswami says that that deer was sitting beside him just like his own loving son, lamenting, seeing her father about to die. And when Bharat saw 
the deer in so much anxiety, with such tears in her eyes, with such love and attachment for him, more than ever, his heart was just filled with affection for that deer and worries for what will happen to the deer when I leave. And in that state of mind, he died. <clears throat> Krishna tells us in Gita, Yam Yam Vapi Smaran Bhavam Tyajat Yante Kalevaram. According to our consciousness at the time of death, we get another body. Because he was engrossed with affection for a deer, Bharat Maharaj, like everyone else in this world, died. He lost his body and he lost his relationship with the deer. At death, you lose everything material. And due to his previous karmas and the inclinations that were in his heart, and due to his neglect of his spiritual practice, those inclinations became prominent. And he took birth as a deer in a nearby jungle. Srila Prabhupada asks a very, very relevant question in this regard. How is it possible? Krishna promises us in Bhagavad Gita, Neha Bikramana Sosti Pratyavayo Nividyate Swalpam Apyasya Dharmasya Trayate Mahatobhaya. In this endeavor of devotional service, there is no loss. Any action in Krishna consciousness is eternal. And even the smallest act in bhakti can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. And what is the most dangerous type of fear? to lose the opportunity of this human form of life and to be cast down again into the lower species where there is no chance of, of, of cultivating our devotional service. Bharat was brought up by Rishabdev, an avatar. He was a great devotee from birth of all the sons of Rishabdev. He had a hundred sons. He chose Bharat to be the king of the world, knowing him to be so qualified. And how he ruled the citizens, perfectly according to the principles of Dharma and Bhakti. And how he exemplary left everything behind. Everything of this world that is impossible for people to give up. He left it with not a second thought. And he was absorbed in hearing the glories of the Lord, in chanting the holy names of the Lord, in worshiping the deity of the Lord, in remembering the Lord, in praying to the Lord. 24 hours a day practically, he was immersed in that way. Why? Why did he have to take the birth of a lower animal? because of one deliberate mistake. It is explained that it was Krishna's arrangement. Because he was so dear to Krishna, and he had endeavors, endeavored so seriously in his Krishna consciousness, Krishna wanted to help him. Even if we're very, very advanced devotees, we still have free will. At any state, we could decide to make another priority over Krishna. And Maya's right there 
to give every opportunity. She will provide every type of temptation and all justifications. In one sense, Bharat Maharaj was trapped. It's not that he was just sitting on the bank of the river and someone said, would you rather be attached to Krishna or a deer? What is your choice? He would have definitely said, Krishna, he is my dear, dear most. But no, all of a sudden, in the, it was just the most unexpected moment. He's doing his bhajan and this, this tiger roars. It's very, very traumatic experience. This lion roars. If you were sitting all alone and just nearby you heard the roar of a lion, that would be very, very shaking. And then he sees this poor little mother deer die on the other bank. And then there's this little, sweet, helpless deer just squirming, squirming in the water, about to drown. And he reached down to save it. And then realized, it's, I've already saved it, but if I don't take care of her, she's going to die. 100% death if I don't take care of her. He was trapped. Maya is so clever. And when you associate, you, you become very much affected by what and who you associate with. But because he was dear to Krishna, because he performed so much bhakti, Krishna personally cast him in a deer's body just to increase his determination to perfect his life without any impediment. And Krishna blessed him so in that little baby deer body he could remember everything about his past life. Not an ordinary deer. And as soon as he was born, even in human life, most babies are really, they don't know what's going on. Yes, they just, they just look around and cry. They don't know who they're with or who they are or what they're doing or where they are. Take some time. But this little deer, as soon as he came out of the womb, he just understood, what have I done? I gave up everything of this world for Krishna. And when I was this far, this far from the perfection of life, of going back to Godhead, I got trapped by attachment to a deer. I wasted so much of my time. He repented. He begged forgiveness from Krishna. That he rejected the Lord of his heart for a material thing. He wasted so much of his time at the very end of his life. That little deer immediately left his mother and went back to the Pulaha Ashram on the bank of the Gandaki River where he left off before. And there he was seeking out to be in the association of saintly people who were hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And 24 hours a day, he was fixed in just remembering Krishna. He wouldn't even eat the nice things the deers like. He would just eat dry leaves, which is tapasya for a deer. practically gave up eating and sleeping, this baby deer just meditated on Krishna day and night. More intensely than he had ever done before. Because he was trying to make up for his offense. The offense of neglect.
In this way, he was just waiting to die. And when he died in that holy place, he took his next birth as the son of a Brahmin in the line of Angira Muni. This Brahmin had a very pure heart. As his father, he was a learned scholar in the Vedas. He had very, very deep devotion. Very kind, charitable, compassionate. This Brahmin had two wives. From his elder wife, he had nine sons. And from his younger wife, he had twins, a daughter and Bharat Maharaj, who was now known as Jad Bharat. Now, from his birth, the father was trying to raise little Jad Bharat to be first-class Brahman, cross over the ocean of birth and death. But Jad Bharat was fully conscious of his mistakes as the king, fully conscious of a whole lifetime as a deer, and he understood Maya is very strong. And he did not want to play with the fire of Maya, which comes through association with people and things. Srila Prabhupada, he would say, the problem with you, boys and girls, meaning all of us, is you do not have sufficient fear of Maya. Maya is very powerful. To play with Maya is playing with fire. He didn't want to play those games. He did not want to take any chance. He knew that as soon as people start honoring you and respecting you and liking you, if it's the wrong people, you get trapped. You start to become attached to that association. He did not want to associate with anyone but devotees. But his family, with the exception of his father, were Karmakandis. They were Brahmins who were very much pursuing material enjoyment through their material, through their Brahminical activities. So to not take any chances he pretended to be blind, deaf, dumb, and completely dull, like we saw in that beautiful performance last night. And the family didn't know what to do with this little Jad Bharat. As he grew up, he wasn't getting better, he was getting worse. His father loved him dearly. His father was so deeply attached to him. In every possible way, he tried to train him. He wanted his children to get married. But he came to the conclusion, there is no woman that's going to marry this boy. So I better teach him to be a brahmachari. It's humbling for all of you brahmacharis. He tried to teach her basic standards of cleanliness. The examples are given in Srimad Bhagavatam. The cleanliness. When you go to evacuate, that means to respond to the calls of nature, you do your duty and then you wash your hands very carefully. And he showed him the Brahminical way of washing hands taking bath. Well, what Jad Bharat, after he was taught the whole lesson, he would go, wash his hands very carefully according to the Brahminical ways, and then go and evacuate. 
and do nothing else after that. His father said, no, no, my son, not like that. First do this. First go like that and then go like this. And he would just like, just be looking into outer space and shake his head like, he wouldn't say anything. Like, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then father would say, now do it, do it. And he would evacuate. No, he would wash his hands and he would evacuate. Everything like this. He tried to teach him scripture. He would just look, not say a word. His father tried to teach him the Gayatri Mantra. For months, he tried to teach his son this one line of the Gayatri Mantra. After four months, finally the father gave up. I, he, I can't teach him. He still hasn't learned. Whatever he was taught, he would expertly do it just the opposite. And people thought he was a madman, a fool, somebody who was, his brain was handicapped from birth. But the amazing thing is he was acting. He was a completely self-realized soul. He was perceiving Krishna, the Paramatma, within his heart. He was seeing the Paramatma in every living being's heart. He was completely detached from anything material and was a compassionate being who was absolutely non-envious friend of all living beings. He was Narottam. He was a first-class human being with all knowledge of all scripture inherently manifesting within him. But he knew, even at that advanced platform, he could fall down if he gets trapped by wrong association. And he did not want to take any chances. So he pretended to be so stupid and except for his father, who with a pained heart loved him so dearly, tried in every possible way to help his son, everyone else ridiculed him, pushed him around, and treated him harshly, cruelly. But he was happy. He was happy to be treated cruelly. He was happy to be blasphemed and criticized and tortured. He didn't mind because he was Atmarama. He was self-satisfied, thinking of Krishna. Pratishta is a very, very great impediment. Wealth, the opposite sex, and prestige. Kanaka, Kamini, Pratishta. These three are great pitfalls for one on the spiritual path. He was behaving in such a way that nobody would give him anything. Nobody would ever marry him. And everybody just ridiculed him. Very safe position. Anyways, the father tried to do everything. Father was very attached to his family, his home, his children. So much attached that like everyone else, he forgot that death would come. But death did not forget him, nor will it forget anyone else. He died. And Jad Bharat's wife, she was in such trauma that she entrusted Jad Bharat to her elder co-wife and she went and ended her life with her, fa with her husband's. This elder wife, his stepmother, 
was not at all kind to him. And his stepbrothers hated him. They thought he was just an embarrassment to the family, and he was just a useless fool. They would ridicule him. They would torture him. They would give him to eat rotten grains that had been eaten by worms, moldy, horrible. And he would just take it in a very gracious way and eat it. He was happy. And they wouldn't give him food unless he worked. They would put him out into the fields to do work. And where he was supposed to make the higher part of the land even with the lower part of the land, he would dig from the lower part and make the higher part higher. And they would beat him. They'd give him some rotten grains or some spoiled food and he would just eat it. He was completely indifferent. He didn't care. He was self-realized. And finally, they just thought him so useless as a job so that they could give him some rotten grains. He had to sit on a, on a high platform in an agricultural field all night long and he was supposed to scare the deer and the wild pigs away when they came to eat the crops. So he was just sitting there totally fixed in Krishna consciousness. But anyone who looked at him, he just looked like a madman. It was at that time that the leader of a band of dacoits wanted to have a son. So he felt that in order to get the favor of the goddess Kali, we will perform a human sacrifice. And the type of sacrifice required a man-animal. That means a man who is crazy like an animal. And they had one. But just before the puja, that man-animal escaped. So the dacoit was really, really, he's a violent man, really violent. He ordered his gang members, find me that man-animal. So they were searching, searching, searching all day, all night. They couldn't find him anywhere. But in the middle of the night, they came to this agricultural field and they saw Jad Bharat just sitting there, completely dull. So they grabbed him. They carried him away. And they brought him to their leader. And he examined his body. He was very strong. Somehow or other, Jad Bharat had a really strong body. So they thought, what a magnificent offering to the goddess. They bathed him. Then they dressed him in fine clothes, anointed him with scented oils, put ornaments and garlands on him. And Jad Bharat was just standing there. He just let anybody do anything to him. He didn't care. And then they put him right on the altar in front of the deity of Kalimata. And the leader of the dacoits had one of his dacoits take the role of the priest. They offered incense to Goddess Kali. They offered flowers. They began to recite various mantras. And at the culmination of this puja, they had a large, sharp sword that was meant to sever the head of Jat Bharat. The objective is after they sever the head, 
they would offer all of his blood to the goddess Kali. And she would drink that blood as if it were intoxicating liquor. And she would be so satisfied by that offering of blood that she would give the leader of the Dakoites a son. Hare Krishna. So they lifted that shining, sharpened sword high in the air and with the chanting of mantras and the beating of drums and the blowing of horns and bugles all of his force he dashed his arm down to cut off the head of the Lord's devotee. But at that moment, the goddess Kali was so angry that they were about to kill Krishna's devotee. The deity of Bhadra Kali burst open just into pieces. And out from the center of that deity came goddess Kali herself. She stood on the altar. Her eyes were red as hot coals. She opened her lips and showed her curved, sharp teeth. Her red tongue hung below. She screamed in anger, grabbed the sword from the Dakwite and cut off his head. Then she went to the other, to every one of the Dakoites. She cut off their heads. And then she went to the leader of the Dakoites and screamed a shrilling, chilling sound and <laughs> cut off his head. And then appearing from Goddess Kali were a whole band of witches and she-demons who were her associates. And they all started screaming and celebrating the death of these demons who tried to harm Krishna's devotee. They were dancing and singing and screaming. Then they took the blood of all those demons and drank it like liquor. And they all became intoxicated drinking the blood of the Dakoites. And then they really had a festival. <laughs> they were dancing, they were singing, they were just for entertainment. They were picking up the heads of the whole bands and like balls they were tossing them to one another while they were screaming in ecstasy. <laughs> and after the whole show ended, the goddess Kali approached Jad Bharat and offered her respectful obeisances and blessings. She could not tolerate an offense to a Vaishnava. Yesterday, His Holiness Jai Patak Maharaj told that story about that Brahman. He said his name was Shivananda and his sons were Sri Krishna and Hari Rama. They became, they were going to do uh, for Durga Puja, they were bringing those buffaloes and goats to their father to sacrifice all of them to Durga Devi. But by the association of Ramchandra Kaviraj and Narottam Das Thakur, they became peaceful Vaishnavas, Paradukaduki. They were so kind and compassionate to all living beings. They let all the goats and buffaloes, they let them go. And when they came home, ultimately the father was outraged. Where are the buffaloes and goats I paid for? He says, I let, we let them go. We are Vaishnavas. Now we are chanting Hare Krishna. He was so angry. He hated Vaishnavas. He hated Vaishnavas the worst possible thing. 
So we heard about how his two sons defeated all the pundits of the village. And then somebody that they preached to in the village defeated the Digvijay pundit. The father was absolutely devastated. He was doing all pujas and pujas and pujas to Kali and Durga to save his sons. He came to the point where he was in so much anguish, he was on the verge of death. And then in a dream, the goddess Durga Devi Chandi appeared to him and she was mad. Why are you offending your sons? They are Vaishnavas. Don't you know I am a devotee of Vishnu? Don't you know that I worship and honor Narottam Das Thakur and Ramachandra Kaviraj? You should follow your sons. And then she lifted her chopper and said, or else I will be back. <laughs> so he became a devotee. Something like that. On the verge of death. Who is Durga? Brahma Samhita explains. She is, she is an expansion of the pleasure potency of Krishna. In Simantadweep, when Goddess Parvati, she saw Lord Shiva chanting the holy names of Goranga in ecstasy. She asked, who is this Goranga you're speaking about? And Lord Shiva explained how he comes in the age of Kali to do what no other avatar does, gives prema bhakti to everyone through Nam Kirtan. So she went to this place under a banyan tree and she meditated and performed tapasya to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he appeared to her. And she's Parvati. She said, I am so unfortunate. All your devotees want to be with you and want to bring everything, everyone else to you. But my service is to keep everyone away from you. To keep everyone bound by this material existence. And Lord Chaitanya told her that actually you are Srimati Radharani. Radharani, my pleasure potency, she manifests in your form to oversee the entire material existence. Lakshmi, Sita, Radha are the potency of the whole spiritual world. And Durga, Chandi, Kali are the different manifestations of Parvati within this material creation. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave her a place as Prodamaya where she would be protecting the holy dham of Sri Navadvipta. When you water the root of the tree, you automatically satisfy every part of the tree. Srimad Bhagavatam tells, when you satisfy Krishna, then all the demigods, all the expansions, all the avatars, they are all fully satisfied. Because Krishna is the root. Krishna's tu Bhagavan Swayam. The cause of all causes. The source of everything. So if you want to satisfy Ganapati, Kali, Durga, Skanda, Surya, Sunni, Huh? Sunny. Shani. Shani. I'm sorry, please. 
If you want to satisfy all of these different personalities, Hanuman, what is the best way? To take shelter of the holy names of Shri Krishna. Krishna, 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 Importantly, to examine Jad Bharat's characteristics. He didn't care. He didn't care that his head was going to be cut off. He didn't try to escape. He didn't lodge any arguments. He was completely satisfied. Like Bhakti Vinod Thakur prays, Maro Bidako Bijo Ichatoha Nityata Saprati Tua Adhikar. My Lord, if you want, you can protect me. If you want, you can kill me. It doesn't matter. I'm your servant. You can do anything you like with me. Srila Prabhupada quotes the great verse of Lord Brahma. Tate no kampam susamikshamano bunjana evatmakritam vipaga. For a devotee in any situation, just thanks Krishna. This is the state of real fearlessness to completely take shelter of the loving service of the Lord. Everybody else was ridiculing him and they were about to kill him without even a second thought. They considered him just to be like an animal. But the goddess of material creation, Kali Dev, honored him and worshipped him and protected him. And he walked into the forest and he was on the bank of a river. At that time, a king named Rahugana of the Sindhu province, he was on a palaquin being taken to Kapil, Kapil Ashram. While they were going, somehow or other, one of the four men holding the palaquin was not able to do so. So three of them, they had to find another. So the, they looked everywhere, and there they happened to see Jad Bharat. So they grabbed him and forced him to carry the pole. Now they saw he was very strong and very beautiful person. But because he looked so dull, they thought he was perfect for the, for the service. As they were walking, every three steps, Jad Bharat stopped just to see if any ants may be crawling on the road. But the problem is the other three men kept walking. So when three people walk carrying a palaquin and one person stops, the whole palaquin became very turbulent. And Maharaj Rahugana, the king, became very angry. What? Why are you stop? Why are you carrying like this? Why are you shaking me like this? And the palaquin holders were really afraid. They said, we are doing everything exactly right. But this new man, he's the one who keeps stopping. So Rahugana focused his glance at Jad Bharat. And said, what? Don't you know how to even... Hold the palaquin? Don't ever do that again. He just looked, didn't say anything. They started walking. Three steps later, he stopped. <laughs> it wasn't just that if there was ants, he stopped to see if there was ants. He would look ahead three steps and then stop three steps and look ahead to make sure he did not want to harm anyone. And again, <laughs> Maharaj Rahugan was very angry. It is said that he became overwhelmed by the mode of passion. And he began to 
sarcastically criticize Jack Bharat and threaten him. He said, is it that you cannot carry this palaquin because you are so small and you are so weak? Do you not know that I am the master? I am the king and you are my servant? I have warned you again and again and you continue to disobey my order? Are you a madman? Are you a fool? Do you not know who I am? If you do not obey what I say, then you will be punished for your disobedience, just like Yamaraj punishes the wicked. I started to go again. Three steps later, he stopped. The king was beside himself. And then Jad Bharat. As far as we know, this was practically the first time in his life he spoke. <laughs> he was a grown man. There's no record of him talking to anybody else. He looked at the king and he said, my dear king. And he honored him for his position. But then he chastised him. He says, you are speaking like you are a very learned, experienced person, but you are a fool. You don't know what you're talking. He said, what are you saying? Just like this palaquin, the body, the body you're talking about is just like a palaquin that's holding the passenger. What you're saying is actually true. Because the soul, the eternal soul, the source of life is, either, is neither strong or weak, is neither fat or, or, or slender. is neither big or small. This material lump of flesh called the material body is what you are so much attached to. But I have no such attachment. I am attached to the eternal soul. And the soul is transcendental to all the considerations of the body. You call yourself my master and I am your servant? It is all temporary. Why should we take it seriously? Because in my next birth, I may be the master and you may be the servant. When King Rahugana heard this, because he had a very strong attachment to hearing discourses of the absolute truth, he was actually a very pious king. He realized, this is a self-realized soul, an avaduta. I offended him. He came right off of his palaquin and prostrated himself at the lotus feet of Jad Bharat and with folded hands begged forgiveness. He said, I am not afraid, King Rahugana. He said, I am not afraid of the thunderbolt of King Indra. I am not afraid of the serpentine, sharp-pointed trident of Lord Shiva. I am not afraid of the punishments of Yamaraj. I'm not afraid of fire. I'm not afraid of weapons. But I have great Fear of committing an offense to a great devotee of the Lord. King Rahugana surrendered himself to Jad Bharat as his guru and very submissively asked him how to get out of this illusion. 
what is best for my spiritual life. Please instruct me. And Jad Bharat gave beautiful instructions. He explained the reason for all the problems that we are all suffering in this world is the uncontrolled mind. When the mind becomes contaminated by the three modes of material nature, it becomes like an independent, uncontrolled, wild elephant. Tramples are good qualities, obscures knowledge of our real well-being. Because of this uncontrolled mind, becoming so much attached to the things of this world, it is the mind alone that forces the spirit soul to transmigrate through the different species among 8,400,000. He said that when the mind is uncontrolled, it is like a lamp, a lamp that does not burn properly. Such a lamp, the, the fire within the lantern just makes the whole glass of the lantern black and gives out no light. But a lamp whose wick is situated in nice pure ghee it doesn't give out any black smoke. It just illuminates, lights up the whole room. In the same way, when the mind is uncontrolled, it obscures all knowledge and incriminates us in karma. But when the mind is under control, it illuminates our life. The mind is our greatest enemy. But when it is controlled, it is our best of friends. And he explained to King Rahugana that the source of this entire cosmic manifestation, the source of everything that exists, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan, who is seated in the Paramatma within every living being's heart. And one who learns properly how to control the mind fixes the mind in the instructions of the spiritual masters and in remembering the Supreme Lord. In this regard, Srila Prabhupada, he writes, that the uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. And if one neglects it or gives it a chance, it will grow more and more powerful and will become victorious. Although it is not factual, it is very strong. It covers the constitutional position of the soul. O king, Please try to conquer this mind by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and the supreme personality of Godhead. Do this with great care. And Srila Prabhupada explains that there is one easy weapon with which the mind can be conquered. Do you know what that weapon is? That's not what Prabhupada says. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada says the one weapon that will conquer the mind is Neglect. The mind is always telling us to do this or that. Therefore, we should be very expert 
in disobeying the mind's orders. Gradually, the mind should be trained to obey the orders of the soul. It is not that one should obey the orders of the mind. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to say that to control the mind, one should beat it with shoes many times just after awakening and again before going to sleep. In this way, one can control the mind. This is the instruction of the Shastras. If one does not do so, one is doomed to follow the dictations of the mind. Another bona fide process is to abide strictly by the orders of the spiritual master and engage in the Lord's service. Then the mind will automatically be controlled. Srila Prabhupada explained this in a very nice way. How to neglect the dictations of the mind. By keeping the mind fixed in positive spiritual thoughts, words, and actions. The path of bhakti is so simple and sublime. Param drisvani vartate. It allows us to keep the mind engaged in higher taste, higher experience. Jad Bharat, he not only taught this, but he lived by it. His mind was constantly engrossed in remembering the Lord. And in this age of Kali, the most accessible, powerful, and simple way of keeping the mind in remembrance of Krishna is to chant the holy name. Yatra is about to end in just a couple hours. Let us take this serious lesson with us. It is the sum and substance of Krishna consciousness. Manmana bhavamad bhakto madhyashim namaskaru. Mame vaishasi satyam te pratijani priyoshi. Always think of me. Become my devotee. Worship me and offer your homage to me. And this way you will come to me without fail. The most powerful lessons of this story are critical to our spiritual progress. One is to be attentive. To utilize our time very effectively. Not to allow anything or anyone in this world to divert our attention away from our sadhana. Even someone as great as Bharat Maharaj fell away from Krishna consciousness and had to suffer an animal body We need the association of devotees to keep our sadhana strong. This is the very, very strong instruction of Srila Prabhupada and the Srimad Bhagavatam. Our sadhana is our spiritual foundation. If you have a strong foundation, any storm can come and you will, if you, you will have the strength to endure it. But even if you have the strength, you have to still make that choice. The choice never comes automatically. Maya will attack. If you have good sadhana and you make the right choice, you will be able to withstand it and make progress through the situation. But if you make the right choice, however strong you are, you will fall. 
But if you're not spiritually strong by your sadhana and association, even if you want to make the right choice, you will be conquered. That is the power of maya. So we need the association of devotees and we need to regularly take shelter of the holy name of the Lord and the Srimad Bhagavatam for our spiritual survival. Another message here in this story is that that by worshipping Krishna you give the greatest happiness to all the devatas. There is no need to worship others. But we should always offer respect to all the demigods. Because the demigods are devotees too. If you disrespect a demigod, you are committing Vaishnava Parad. We honor, we respect the devatas. As Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us by his own example. But we know that surrendering to Krishna, we get the highest benediction of all the devatas. Another lesson is how dangerous Vaishnava Bharat is. Actually, the Srimad Bhagavatam tells that what happened to those dacoits their heads got cut off. Their blood was drunk by female demons and witches. So that's what happens to anyone who offends Vaishnavas. Hare Krishna. Now we may not see that happening before our eyes. But in spirit that's what happens. In due course of time. So we should be very much concerned. Jad Bharat never offended anyone. He simply was the well-wishing friend of everyone. And when he finally met someone that was receptive to him, he spoke. And how forgiving was Jad Bharat? King Rahugana was blaspheming him, criticizing him threatening him. Now how many of you are nice to someone who does that to you? But he was He was humble. He was tolerant. He was ready to offer all respect to others and he didn't care. As Jaipatak Swami Maharaj said, we should not expect respect for ourselves. When you expect Maharaj was saying, you will definitely be frustrated because you never consistently get what you expect. The more you expect, the more anxiety your life will be filled with. Instead of expecting, we should just accept, perform our service and accept what Krishna gives, what he sends, and be grateful then we can always be happy in any situation. This is the consistent quality of Vaishnavas. Yesterday there was the drama about Haridas Thakur. He was being beaten and whipped and they were blaspheming and trying to kill him and he was praying for their welfare. That is Vaishnav. Nityananda Prabhu, they were blasting him, beating him on the head, trying to kill him, and he was praying for their forgiveness. A devotee is a friend. Jad Bharat explained to Rahugana that this material existence is like a forest. And a materialistic person is like a merchant who sells his wares makes some profit, and then tries to invest it and enjoy it in the forest of material existence. But there are so many mosquitoes and lions and tigers and snakes and dacoits in the form of envious people. Whoever you are, whether you're devotee or not devotee, 
Try to do something good in this world and see what the result is. People will envy you. Hare Krishna. Sometimes we tell the story of that king in France. He was so great. He built a magnificent palace, which even hundreds of years later, still millions of people go there a year to see this palace. And he was inviting all the noblemen and kings and princes from other places to enjoy. And he would just give them so much good food and good intoxication and good entertainment. And he wanted to impress them. But what was the result? He did impress them with envy. They were envious. He had more than them. And ultimately, those same men, they arranged, they in, inspired a revolution that, will kit, that would kill the king and kill the queen. Hari hari. So those people we try to impress by our material expertise in this material world, they usually become envious. And even if you don't try to impress them, do anything substantial and people will envy you and they'll try to destroy you according to their capacity. Sometimes they kill you. Sometimes they speak horrible things against you. Sometimes they make public campaigns against you. Sometimes they spread lying rumors about you. Sometimes they try to undermine what you're doing and get you to lose everything. Srila Prabhupada explains that is the basic principle of material existence, envy. Duryodhana was envious. And that was the principle in which the Bhagavad Gita was spoken. How to deal with the envy of Duryodhana and all the people he affected. So yes, in this forest of material existence, very difficult place. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said this material existence is no place for a gentleman or a lady. He said it's like a latrine. Yes, a latrine is a dirty place, even if you keep it nice and clean. It's like at Radha Gopinath Temple. For years we've been trying to keep our public latrine clean. Clean latrine. Very difficult. In India, somehow or other. In the West, it's not so difficult. But India, they have these Brahminical standards that they don't know how to apply properly. Especially devotees. The hardest to keep a devotee bathroom clean. That's my realization. Because what happens is devotees, after they complete what they came for. <laughs> they have these Brahminical standards where they have to wash their feet. Yes? And the way they wash their feet, we have a place where they can wash their feet, but they usually don't bother to get there. They just, from the sink, they just take water and start throwing it on their f feet. And because they walk barefoot, you know, to the bathroom, their feet are kind of dirty and therefore all this mud gets on the floor. Yes, and no matter how much you clean it, the next devotee comes in and washes his feet in the middle of the floor. I don't know if ladies do that because I haven't been in your bathroom. Yet. <laughs> Very difficult. But even if you have the cleanest bathroom, who stays there? Hmm? Well, let's, let's have our meeting in the latrine. It's a place, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur says, you go in and you get out. You do your business and get out. The material world, it's a dirty place. Why is it a dirty place? Because the basic principle of why people are here is envy. 
And it is that envy alone that causes so much problem in this world. It is the root of lust, anger, false pride, arrogance, war, hatred, and all these karmas that come along with it. So Jad Bharat was completely non-envious. And Krishna tells Arjuna, you can understand this message only because you have no envy. So Jad Bharat, even though he was being threatened and blasted by King Rahugana, he was the best friend. He spoke to enlighten him. He cared nothing about what happened to him. He was only concerned with the welfare of that man who was attacking him. That is another great lesson of this story, the quality of a Vaishnav, to forgive in the spirit of a servant under all circumstances, on a personal level. And we also learn about the nature of the mind. Our upliftment or our downfall is all based on how we respond to the mind. Nam Sankirtan is the prime benediction for all humanity because it helps us to neglect the order of the uncontrolled mind and fill it with the grace of Krishna. So please, as you are leaving from Pune Yatra, take these instructions very seriously. We need each other. We should create a loving, forgiving family based on these principles. There's a couple people I would like to call on to speak. Is Nilesh Prabhu here? Where? Can you please come here? He has an interesting story. During the terrorist attacks in Bombay, he was a member of the anti-terrorist squad. He was in the Taj Mahal Hotel, face to face, with a gun in hand, fighting the terrorists. Now, while he's coming, hopefully he's coming, huh? he has a very, some nice realizations. But the mind is kind of like the Taj Mahal Hotel. And somehow or other, we have allowed these terrorists to come in in the form of lust, envy, anger, pride, greed, and illusion. And sadhana bhakti means to fight those terrorists. Nilesh went to join his duty. He left. I guess you'll have to hear the story another time. Does anyone know the story? Anyways, he was telling me very much detail. I won't go into so many details. But he was face to face with these terrorists. And they were throwing hand grenades and shooting their weapons. 
And when they would throw these hand grenades, there would be so much smoke, they would, the, the police wouldn't even know where they were or where, be, where they were being attacked from. So he was with two other police, and the smoke was there, and they were being shot at. And he started to chant Lord Nursingadev's prayers. And on his cell phone, his cellular phone, he has the Nursinga mantra, so he turned it on. And he kept it on really loud. Namaste Narasingaya. He was playing it and meditating and praying on Lord Nursinga Dave. And when the smoke cleared, his two assistants, who was not assistants, his two associates who were on either side of him, were shot dead. But he was alive. A pillar happened to be right in front of him and blocked all the bullets that would have killed him. And what Nilesh said to me was, just like Lord Narasimha Dev appeared from a pillar to protect Prahlad, he appeared as a pillar to protect me. So in the Taj Mahal hotel of our mind, <laughs> when we're being attacked by Maya with the bullets and the hand grenades of lust and envy and anger and pride and greed and illusion and all the smoke of confusion that comes when all of these things happen, our only shelter is to take shelter of the Lord and his holy name. <laughs> and Brahmananda Prabhu wanted to speak something also to all the devotees. Would all of my god brothers and god sisters please come forward? Chintamani Devi, Sukhavaha Devi, if Chandramali Maharaj or Bhakti Vishramba, Madhava Maharaj may be here. Kostuba Prabhu, if you are here, could you please come forward?
Amar Gyan at Mirandasha, Gyanan Gyanasha Vakaya, Csak Surun Milita Jena Tasmai Shri Gura Venama. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Butale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamne. Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishya Shashunya Vadi Pashyata Desha Tarine. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Mityananda Shri Advaita Gdadar Shri Vasati Gaurava Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Дорогие предни, я сегодня очень хотел бы рассказывать вам очень уникальная история для одного очень великого, возвышенного преданного, который является образцом преданности. И я очень хотел эту историю вам рассказывать. Это, благодаря этого преданного, на самом деле, мы все сегодня здесь находимся. Just because of these devotees, all of us, we can uh, today uh, gather here and sit here. Uh, когда Uh, чистый преданный направляется искать абсолютную истину. When a pure devotee is trying to search the absolute truth, он сталкивается с различными uh, uh, испытаниями. He is facing diff- different difficulties and tests and going through tests. И я хочу вам рассказывать, как Радханат Махарадж направился искать абсолютную истину. So I want to tell you how Radnat Maharaj was uh, searching for the absolute truth. Он был совсем молодым человеком, всего 18 лет. He was a very young man, only 18 years old. И он uh, искал абсолютную истину uh, очень страстно. And he was Searching for the absolute truth very eagerly. Он направился в Грецию. He headed towards Greece. И поднялся на одну гору и сел там на медитацию. And he went on one mountain and he was sitting there in meditation. А и после долгого медитации Uh, голос сверху сказал ему, тебе нужно отправиться в Индию. And after long meditation, the voice from the sky told him to go to the India. Но он был молодым человеком, у него не было ни деньги, ничего, и он решил пешком отправиться в Индию. But he was a very young man, and he didn't have any money and anything. So he decided to go to India just by walk. И он пешком пошел в Турцию. So by walking he he get to the uh, Turkish. И оттуда в Иран. Then из Ирана в Афганистан. Иран. И еле добрался до границы Индии. And somehow he get to the border of India. Несмотря на то, что он приехал э, к границе Индии, и у него была виза, 
Она же, у него не было деньги, а в те времена был строгий закон, и без денег никого не пускали в Индию. И одна женщина очень строго uh, говорила, что мы тебе не пустим это в, в Индию, верни свою родину. И несколько дней он, он там ждал у границы, и постоянно смена менялась, и эти женщины менялись, но все равно его не пускали. И э, через несколько дней, когда еще одна женщина, он подошел, отдал паспорт, тот и, и его отказал. Он говорит, как я вернусь в мою родину, если моей родине убивают коров, как я туда пойду? Скажите, пожалуйста. They, he, he was again rejected, and uh, then he, he told that, how can I come back to my uh, motherland where uh, the cows are killed? И это очень сильно действовало на эту женщину. Она говорит, реально в вашей стране убивают коров? So, uh, that uh, these words uh, had a very deep influence on, on that uh, lady uh, and she, she was asking is it real, real, real that in your country the cows are killed so she allowed him to uh, allowed him entry the country and when he reached the border with him they started Krishna so When he came to India, uh, then some uh, pastimes, Krishna played some pastimes with him. Наш Господь Кришна очень игривый. Our Lord Krishna, he is very playful. И он like, очень любит играть со своими преданными. So he likes to play uh, different pastimes with his devotees. И он что, первым столкнулся, он встретился с группой людей, so которые early, обещали его напоить каким-то священным напитком, который оказался наркотическим. So first he met some group of people, and they promised uh, to give him some sacred drink, uh, beverage, but uh, it was... Some sort of, uh, some sort of a drug. И он полностью потерял сознание это. And so he, he drank this, and uh, he almost lost his consciousness. He lost his consciousness. И он несколько часов лежал так это. So he was laying like this there. Он очень мучился, потому что он раньше никогда не пробовал подобного напитка. И он так добрался в другое место в Дели, какой-то базарном площади, когда увидел там большой толпа людей собрались и что-то происходит там. Then he got to some marketplace and there he saw a crowd of 
people uh, and they so were doing something there. И это, э, он подошел и посреди толпы смотрел змеявик, играет со змеями, э, э, гремучими своими змеями, это, которые. И он подошел поближе, чтобы посмотреть. So he went closer. И этот змеявик посмотрел на него, и один из самых больших своих змей направил на него. И эта змея поползла ему по шею, крутился, и вот так стоит перед лобом. And then that snake just embraced Maharaj, and, and she was staring at him. А змеявик стал требовать от него 500 рупий, иначе он говорил, я не сниму этого змеи с твоего шеи. And then that snake charmer told that you, uh, you either you give the 500 rupees, or otherwise I will not... Uh, let this snake uh, to, uh, to, uh, to go away from you. А у него не было ни копейки деньги, нечего было платить это. But he, had, but he didn't have had any money at the time. И он так долго стоял, он uh, змеявику говорил, что у него нет денег, а тот все равно требовал деньги. Он говорил, пока не дашь 500 рупий, с тебя не будет снять эта змея. Она не будет слезть это. И он был стоял for so for quite a long time there, and uh, the snake charmer was still uh, trying to get his 500 rupees, but uh, Maharaj was trying to explain to him that he, he didn't had has any any money. И один человек видел, как он мучает ему, он uh, Uh, несколько часов uh, там пошел по своим делам, uh, вернулся обратно, и он увидел, как этот змеявик еще держит этих змей uh, на шее этого молодого человека. So that this snake charmer is still uh, is still trying to. И ему очень совесть стал мучить это. Он подошел к этому змеявику и стал говорить ему, чтобы тот снял змей. So that person came to the to this snake charmer and he started to. Um, to plead this snake charmer to to let uh, to let Maharaj go. И он ему удалось договариваться за каких-то 200 рупий сторговать с ним, заплатил ему и тот снял эти змеи. So somehow he paid to his snake charmer some 200 rupees, and uh, then only. After that, uh, Snake Charmer let Maharaj go. Я на самом деле вам рассказываю, но вы не представляете, какое терпение надо иметь, чтобы несколько часов змея так окутана на вашем шее и прямо перед носом его... So, <clears throat> I'm just trying to tell you, but it's actually unimaginable how, 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 uh, how a man feel like this, standing there and uh, embraced by a snake. И после этого он направился в другой базарный площадь, где он встретился какого-то продавца, который продавал фотографии разных богов. 
And then he went to some other marketplace, and there he, he met some other man who was selling some pitch, pictures of different demigods. Please, please. Turn off microphone. <laughs> И он там, э, он там выбрал голубого Кришну, это, не зная, кто он это, и свои последние пасти заплатил, и все, что было у него, отдал, и он купил эту фотографию. So somehow, Allah Maharaj didn't know anyone from all these pictures, but he chose, uh, he, he had chosen the uh, picture of Krishna. Blue boy. So, blue boy. And he... Finish. Say something about book distribution, and then, and then let someone else speak. Распространение книг, и потом позвольте кому-то другому говорить. Я не могу рассказывать о распространении книг. Как я могу рассказывать о распространении книг? Я хочу прославлять чистого преданного Кришне. И мне не дают такой возможности, чтобы я прославил чистого преданного. Лучше следовать наставлениям чистого преданного, говорит Сандрамавли Махарадж. Thank you very much, Brahmananda. <laughs> Brahmananda Prabhu, now my turn. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't know, I don't know what he was talking, but he's. <laughs> I just cannot express my gratitude to Radnath Maharaj uh, for the chance to be among all, all of you, all of these devotees. On the same day, here we are in this material world, showing the example of the spiritual world. He gives only service, and the material world is going to be an exploitation. А он только показывает пример служения. Это служение нас привлекает и завоевывает наши сердца. In this material world, he is giving us an example of uh, uh, spiritual consciousness by always giving all of us service, by offering his service to, to us. And usually in material world, we only have an experience of exploitation. И куда мы не идем, мы сталкиваемся только любви, это тепла, внимание, это его его внутреннее настроение передается его ученикам, и это распространяется, это это просто затрагивает душу это. Поэтому я не знаю, как выражать мою благодарность его лотосным стопам. So whenever he goes, he's just giving his love and care, and uh, he is also giving this mood to his disciples, and that's why I, I just cannot, uh, I just don't know how to express my gratitude uh, to him. Давайте все вместе это поблагодарим это Радханат Махарадж. Express our deep gratitude to Radnath Maharaj for this. Haribo! 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 Thank you, Brahmananda Prabhu. Let us express our sincere gratitude for his life of devotional service and for coming all the way from Moscow just to give us his association. Navina Nirada Prabhu and 
Venkata Bhatta Prabhu, if you could both come to the front also. All of you, if you would just like to give some words of encouragement to all of the devotees before we end. Hare Krishna, what a great honor to be amongst so many wonderful Vaishnavas and such pure representatives of Srila Prabhupada, Radhanath Swami. I can't wait to come back. I have so many new friends now. And um, this is, I, I don't know, I've never even heard of the Puniyatra. I don't know how, how that was possible, but this is so wonderful. I'm just going to tell one short story about Srila Prabhupada that happened with me. <clears throat> when I was a, a brand new devotee, um, <clears throat> we went with Srila Prabhupada from Columbus, Ohio to New Vrindavan. It was in May, and when I, after the long drive, after about four hour drive and then a walk up to the farm, which, which was a few miles, uh, I got there and Srila Prabhupada was sitting outside and the devotees were sitting all around Srila Prabhupada. They were scattered around him and um, it was a perfect beautiful day. Um, and then Satyabhama came out with some prasadam. I was very, very hungry after the long trip. And we all had prasadam and when she come out, came out with seconds, she accidentally skipped over me when she was serving the, the other devotees. And in front of Srila Prabhupada, I, I was not going to ask for more, but as, as soon as I thought in my mind, I wish I had more, Srila Prabhupada looked up right at me and said, oh, you want more? <clears throat> it scared me so much. My eyes got big and I, I just nodded my head, yes. <clears throat> And then all I could think was, Srila Prabhupada knows everything that I'm thinking. So being a brand new devotee and uh, not really experienced con controlling my mind, every time I saw Srila Prabhupada, I got very, very scared and just wanted to crawl into a hole in the ground because I, I would, I would here's Srila Prabhupada, he knows everything I'm thinking, so I, met, I better not think blank. I'd think a bad word. Oh, no, he knew I thought blank. And here, it, oh, I was getting so nervous for two days. I just, I couldn't even look at him. And then one day, I was getting very uptight, and here he comes. I want to crawl into a hole, and she'll probably, but he comes out of his way. He walks up to me. He has this really huge smile, and he just looks down at me, and he just says, it is all right. And I could relax a little bit then because, for one thing, it's like Srila Prabhupada knew I wasn't my mind. And he could see I was really trying. And just like Krishna tells Arjuna, it's very difficult to control the mind, just like it's difficult to control the wind. But it is possible. It takes practice. And this is how we control our senses. We have to control the mind. We can't allow the mind to wander. We have to bring it back. If we practice this, bringing back the mind, we make a lot of spiritual advancement. And even if we have trouble, Srila Prabhupada will be looking, smiling, going, it is all right, because we're trying. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for all your association so much. Hare Krishna. First of all, I want to thank you again and again, Radnath Marsh, for your kindness to me since I first came to India three years ago, like all that kindness, and f for allowing me to come to Puniatra again and again. 
every time I come, I feel like another layer of my ego is being shed. And I feel like um, I learned so much. So I'm, I'm very grateful for <clears throat> the opportunity to be in this association. Thank you. And I also want to thank um, each and every one of you because I don't know if you realize how much of a difference each one of you makes. We have this philosophy, we think, well, we are insignificant. But we tend to take that to the point where I'm insignificant, so it really doesn't matter what I do because I'm so insignificant, it really doesn't matter. But in fact, every single second, every single thought, every single action we take, makes a difference one way or the other. And so each one of you, in some way or another, directly or indirectly, have made a difference for me personally, and I want to thank you for that. Um, you continue to shower me with your love, which comes from Krishna and through Radnath Maharaj and then through you, and it melts another piece of my heart, my hard heart. And I'm grateful for that healing that you continue to provide for me. And really, if we hear Maharaja's words and take them seriously, even a simple thing like, now that we've heard about the bathroom issue, <laughs> Just a simple thing like now being conscious of how we wash our feet. And if each one of us would just take that responsibility, that could make a huge difference. Just in that one little area. What to speak if we took everything that he said and really applied it. So we are responsible for applying what we hear. It's not just like that we get the mercy and just give me the mercy. We're responsible for taking that mercy and applying it moment after moment. And when we don't apply it, then we're responsible for just saying, wow, I, I didn't apply it here, and look what happened. So I just request that you really take these words, um, let them touch you, and let them affect your every action, which you are already doing, but keep doing it. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Om Ajnana Tamarandasya Ajnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshar Unmilitam Jena Tazmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Um, I'd like to thank Radha Swami for asking me to speak. I don't feel that I'm in any way more qualified than anybody here to speak, and I'm sure that every single person here would have something more valuable to say. But it does give me the opportunity to express uh, some gratitude, so I thank you for the opportunity. First, I'd like to thank uh, Krishna Chandra Prabhu and his entire family for arranging this entire event. Um, I've really been just in a constant state of not only appreciation, but really just amazement at this entire yatra. Um, how he's managed to provide for all of us such a large number of people in such a restricted space. How he's managed to serve everyone on such a high level is, um, I just... Can't, couldn't imagine that such a thing could be done. And as I've walked around uh, and watched uh, what's taking place, I've just 
been amazed and just filled with happiness to see it going on. From up in the kitchen, where they've been cooking such a huge amount of prasad, and they're up there doing it with such apparent ease. Uh, they all seem so relaxed and happy, and uh, the quality of the prasad is just so super fantastic. And then from up there, you can look down onto this playground here and see hundreds of little children. They all look like uh, complete angels with their tilak, and they're all just having uh, such fun. And when I see that, I think that as they grow older, they'll all remember their youth and how they were at the Puniyatra every year, uh, playing and hearing kirtan and just having so much fun. And that it'll create such a such a wonderful, deep, pure impression in their consciousness that will manifest in beautiful ways in the future. And seeing all the devotees under the pandal hearing or dancing and chanting and kirtan, uh, I have just some glimpse of what Keturi Festival must have been like. And so many, all the other services, all the people in the background who've done all the, all the things that one wouldn't think about where all the shoes will go and registering everyone and making sure everyone has water and all these different, all these details that if they weren't taken care of would, in, in a situation like this would go out of control and create some kind of big problem. Everything's been taken care of so perfectly. So I thank Krishna Chandra Prabhu, his family, um, and everybody else who's uh, contributed to the, the management of this festival. And I would like to thank every single person here. Um, I feel, just from being in your association, I feel, and I speak for my wife also, Gita Priya, because we talk about these things uh, at the end of the day. But we really feel a very deep kind of uh, loving friendship with everybody here, every single person, every man, woman, child, old person, young person. We may not know you personally, uh, but just being with you here in this situation, the circumstance, the wonderful festival, uh, we feel your very pure uh, Krishna conscious energy coming from every single face here. And actually this view that I have right now, it's nice to see from this angle because I just feel such, uh, it's like a, a bath of pure Krishna consciousness getting, receiving the gaze of all of you at one time. So I really thank you everyone. And above all, I want to thank His Holiness Srila Radha Swami. Because the reason why this festival is so wonderful and the reason why all of you are so wonderful is because I think you're all reflecting uh, the qualities that He uh, possesses so deeply. And through His words and through His example, I see He's invested all of those in the hearts of all of you. So my very deep gratitude goes out to Srila Radha Swami. I, I'd like to Thank you and express uh, on the behalf of Gita Priya and myself that really we're your property. Will you please just uh, take our lives and mold them in any way that you see fit. Thank you, Marge. Haribo! Thank you.